Namaste, Namaskaram, Hello India. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. I'm Paul Ravindranath and I'm back with a second episode of Ask Google Devs India and this one is on Android 11. Thank you to all the developers out there for sending us your questions. We have Android developer advocates Fred Chung and Daniel Galpin who will be answering them. In case you missed our last episode on Kotlin, don't worry, we've added it to the link in the description. Check it out. And before I hand it off to Fred and Daniel, here are the top five updates from India's developer ecosystem. Now, since the COVID-19 outbreak, Google for Startups in India has been contributing actively to support startups in the ecosystem. We've done this through one-on-one -on -one mentorships and webinar content. To enable the startups to overcome these tough times, we've actually worked with our collaborators in the ecosystem, VCs, founders, mentors, to create a playbook for startups to face the COVID-19 challenge. The playbook is a compilation of practical suggestions for founders to address both the strategic and the operational challenges that are posed by the pandemic. You can find a link to the playbook in the description below. It's a wonderful read. Across India, Google Developer Groups, GDGs, are hosting online meetups until August, covering what's new in Android 11. You can attend any one of these meetups by clicking the link in the description below. Would you like to learn to build powerful and useful websites? The GDG communities, again, are hosting Web.Dev Live India. It's a four-day digital event from the 9th to the 12th of July to learn modern web techniques and of course to connect with other developers. Register in the link in the description. The Developer Student Club Leads of India came together in June to host DSC OMG, which brought together developers across India for talks and hands-on learning. They have shared a first look of the amazing projects built by the student developer community in India. You can watch the recorded sessions on the website. Check out the link in the description. Whether you're an aspiring developer, a student developer, or a professional developer, we have programs that will interest you. Follow the link in the description to see how you can join a developer community near you. Those were the top five updates for you. It's now time to answer your questions on Android 11. Over to Fred and Daniel. But do stay tuned till the end because I'll be announcing the topic for the next episode. Hi, I'm Fred from the Android team. I hope you are doing well. And I'm Dan Galpin, also from the Android team. I've done a lot of work in the past few years on our Android training courses, and this is a great time to learn some new skills. Thank you for submitting your questions on Android 11 and a few other development topics. Since we just launched Android 11 beta, we've picked 11 questions from your submissions. OK, let's get started on the first one. It reads, what's the Android 11 name? That's a great question. Dan, would you like to take that? Android 11. In all seriousness, we switched to using numbered releases out of Android 10. It keeps things simpler, although we still do have an internal code name. What are the new features you've added in Android 11, and how much do we have to improve our developing knowledge with this new version? Well, there's a ton of cool stuff in Android 11. Device and media controls, new privacy features, better support for displays that wrap around device edges, foldable devices in 5G, conversations and chat bubbles, voice access, and more. Now, developers should pay close attention to app behavior changes. These changes can prevent your app from working properly. For more on all of this, check out our What's New in Android 11 video in the Android 11 beta blog post. Fred, why don't you take the next one? This question reads, how to query or interact with other installed apps on Android 11? OK, this is about a new behavior change called package visibility. Before Android 11, Apps by default can see other installed apps on the same device using Package Manager. And they are able to directly start another application's activities. To provide more visibility to the system, this has been restricted for apps that target API level 30. For a number of common cases, you actually don't need to make any changes. For example, if you need to interact with your own app's activities, or if you're using implicit intents to interact with other applications, such as asking the camera app to take a picture for you with an image capture intent. In some cases, however, 
applications must declare a new manifest entry called queries. There's a couple of options to implement this. You can either declare the exact list of package names within the queries elements, or you can declare the intent filter signatures. In some less common cases, you may need broad visibility access to all the installed packages on the device. For example, if you're building a launcher app or a browser app, you may declare the new permission called query all packages. However, keep in mind that uh, this should be rare and there's an upcoming Google Play policy around the usage of this permission. I'll take this next one. I need tutorials, books, and references on advanced Android app development other than the documentation in Android developers' website and videos are on YouTube. What is the best way to learn Android 11 from scratch and what software should be used for beginners and what career opportunities are for it? I don't know what the best way is to learn Android from scratch, but I can tell you we have up-to-date trainings at developer.android.com. We've even launched the first unit of a course designed to teach Android development in Kotlin to people that have no programming experience. Back to you, Fred. This question reads, will we be seeing better keyboard handling passed down to older versions of Android? I wanted to first provide some background for everyone. This question really refers to window insets and IME improvements in Android 11. I'm going to talk about these first, then we'll come back and address this specific question. Over the years, developers have been asking for a way to detect the state and the size of the IME. It's a long overdue feature, but now we have it. Through window insets API changes in the platform, you can detect uh, the state of different on-screen windows, including the status bar navigation or the IME. Uh, you can detect things like if the IME is visible, how big it is, and where it is on screen. You can get this information about the keyboard as it comes up to the screen so you can react to it. From within the app, you can also drive changes to the keyboard so that these things stay synchronized. Here's an animation of what we can do now on Android 11. On the left, as the keyboard comes up, your app can listen for inset changes to synchronize its state with the keyboard. On the right, as the user scrolls the content, the app can drive the animation of the keyboard, so it is again synchronized with your app. If you want to learn more, check out our sample on GitHub. Getting back to the original question, will we see these improvements passed down to older versions of Android? We hope so too. In fact, we are actively investigating this right now and hoping to get something working soon. Jetpack Compose will mark the end of XML layout and UI widgets for Android? Well, Jetpack Compose is still in developer preview, and one of its coolest features is the way it can interoperate with Android's XML UI system. I definitely recommend checking it out and letting us know what you think. We have a security question here. Uh, what are the security improvements since Android 10? There's actually a, a number of security improvements in this release. I can share one notable example in detail here. It's common for Android devices to support various biometric-based authentication technologies, such as your fingerprint, uh, iris, or facial. Different technologies have varying degrees of security and spoofability. For example, 3D face unlock is generally stronger than 2D face unlock. Now, there's a standard way to uh, differentiate these. Your application can specify the intended level of security needed for biometric authentication. Strong, weak, or non-biometric credential like a PIN or a password. Here's a code snippet that demonstrates how you can ensure that the device is set up with strong biometric authenticator before proceeding with user auth. You can do this check through Biometric Manager. If you are building, say, a banking app, this may come in handy. Also note that we are working on updating the Android X biometric library with corresponding support that's backwards compatible. So please stay tuned for that. Another question about our trainings. Almost all the code labs that I worked on had fragments used mostly, unlike activities in Java. Is there any particular reason why fragments are preferred in Kotlin? Is this the recommended way? Much of the reason that you're seeing fragments used in our Kotlin code labs is that they tend to be newer. Newer apps tend to use the navigation component, and the navigation graph is designed around a single activity with multiple fragments. It's definitely the preferred way to use navigation. 
when the depth APIs would be released, how to use those on dual camera devices. I want to get depth images from Android dual camera devices. Help. Actually, since Android 6.0 or API level 23, the platform can report whether a camera can produce depth measurements from its field of view. You can do so by querying the object called camera characteristics and see whether it includes a key called request, available, capabilities, depth, output. It's a long name. Uh, to see a more complete implementation on how it works, check out our, our existing camera 2 example on GitHub. Speaking of camera 2, while it's flexible, it can be uh, quite complex for some developers. If your goal is to implement some common uh, camera use cases like capturing a picture, uh, you can check out the uh, latest camera X Jetpack library. It provides abstraction to common use cases, so it's easier to use. Uh, it works on 94% of devices since API level 21, and it ensures consistency across devices. Check that out. What happens when we rotate our apps? When an app switches between portrait and landscape modes when the device is rotated, lots of things happen. Most relevant to Android developers is that we destroy and restart the activity so it can adjust to the new configuration and use the correct resources. This allows you to just declare a different layout for portrait or landscape, and the correct layout will be chosen when the activity is recreated. If you're using Android Jetpack's view model, it will be reattached when your activity is recreated, allowing you to preserve data during these rotations. Thank you, Fred and Daniel, for answering the questions on Android 11. Now that you have answers for Android, it's time to ask Google Devs India anything on web technologies, which is the theme for our next episode. Drop your questions in the link in the description. If you'd like to know more about the latest shows and updates from Google Devs India, hit the subscribe button. You can also follow us on Twitter at Google Devs IN. That's all for now, folks. Stay safe, and I'll see you in the next episode.